Good morning, Rob. Thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me this morning. Um, could you give our audience a little bit about your background, tell us about uh, where you live, where you work, etc.? Sure. Uh, I uh, live in uh, Dallas, Texas, and I work for Texas Instruments in the Education Technology Group. Uh, this is the group that makes the uh, graphing calculators that uh, you probably used in high school, and uh, we also do quite a lot of other kinds of things with uh, math and science education. Uh, the, uh, prior to that, uh, for a long time I was up in the uh, Chicago area and uh, uh, worked with, uh, worked in a, a number of different places. Uh, for 15 years I was the chief instructional architect of uh, a system called Plato Learning, which, uh, which is uh, still out there. It's one of the original computer-based instruction systems. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to human performance technology? Sure. It was uh, while I was uh, in my uh, doctoral work at uh, Indiana University in Bloomington back in the, back when the Earth was cooling, and uh, 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 the uh, as you know, uh, Bloomington is uh, is a bit of a hotbed of of HPT activity. Always has been because of the influence of Tiagi and, and other people. And I actually took a course from Tiagi uh, at one point and uh, 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 started hearing about HPT uh, in that kind of a context. Uh, and this was back when the term was just being coined, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, qu the question that came up at the time was, was sort of, what, what do we call this thing that we do? It's, it's, it's broader than instructional design, and uh, it's broader than, certainly broader than program learning. Uh, uh, and, and, and broader than training, uh, but, and yet at the same time we think we have something really unique to offer uh, in, in terms of systematic thinking about performance problems. And so the question is, how, well, what do we call that thing? And that, that was out of that kind of a dialogue that was going on back then in the, uh, the uh, mid-1970s came, came the term HPT, and so I was uh, sort of right in the middle of that. Excellent. Thank you. Who besides someone like Tiagi, the others at Indiana University and elsewhere, who have been your biggest influences in this world of human performance technology? Oh, gee, uh, uh, the, uh, there are so many. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, Mager and Bob Mager and, and, uh, and uh, Gary Rumler uh, 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 have, been, have been major influences. There was at the time uh, in, uh, uh, in in Chicago at Arthur Anderson a very large and very professional uh, uh, corporate uh, 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 training and and uh, and HPT group and uh, and I learned a great deal by interacting with my colleagues there uh, through the local uh, Chicago Chicago chapter of ISPI. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, some uh, some important uh, books and articles started appearing in uh, in perform what is now performance and instruction, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 and some of those were I think considered to be quite similar. Some of those uh, works by uh, uh, people like uh, Claude Lineberry, uh, for example, and uh, uh, certainly Joe Harless, uh, uh, who was uh, uh, who was Perhaps one of the one of the most effective people in in sort of making it all making it all accessible mm -hmm. uh, at the time. Uh, 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 so uh, very uh, very important uh, influences. Uh, also, uh, I happened uh, while I was uh, in my doctoral work in Indiana, uh, there happened to be a very strong behavioral psychology uh, group in of all places the business school and in the uh, organizational development department. Uh, the business school, which is a uh, bit of an unusual place for it, but I had, as a result of that, I had some, some very, very strong uh, coursework in uh, in uh, behavioral psychology that served me that has served me well ever since. Uh, 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 subsequently, uh, I added to that uh, uh, considerable work in uh, cognitive psychology and uh, and so on, but, and, and that came from that came from other some, uh, from some other people. Uh, uh, not directly involved with the society, mm -hmm. so uh, so so there's that. In in, in terms of in terms of uh, uh, the uh, the work of the uh, uh, of, of instructional designer of the training side, 
uh, uh, I paid very close attention to the kinds of things that Harold Stolovich has done over the years, Rich Meyer. Uh, certainly been very articulate working with Ruth Clark uh, in summarizing the, uh, the solid uh, research base. I've always paid very close attention to what the solid, what, what, what the underlying research is that's, that, that's backing up our field. And, that, and that, that's, those are the people that I tend to read. Mm -hmm. Speaking of reading, you are an author yourself and have written several books and mm -hmm. chapters. What have you published in the near past and what are, if anything, are you working on here for the future? Mm, gee, well, we're just, uh, Ken Silver and I just finished editing uh, volume one of the new uh, handbook series and, uh, on, uh, and volume one is on instructional design. Quite excited about it. I think it, uh, uh, it captures uh, the state of the art in in that field uh, better than anything that I've seen recently, and uh, 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 really talks about what the leading edge is in, in, in terms of in terms of instructional design. Uh, it's a field that has evolved uh, very rapidly uh, in over the past decade or so, and and this is this is this is really the first book I think uh, that a book length treatment of, of some of those new developments. Uh, so I'm you know, very, very, very excited about that. Uh, Ken Silver and I and Mike Stelnicki uh, did a book uh, 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 a couple of years ago on a textbook uh, on, uh, on instructional design, which reflects some of the uh, uh, cognitive underlying changes in cognitive learning theory uh, that, uh, that are quite important. And uh, that that book has uh, is still in print. It is uh, it has been uh, uh, adopted in a number of programs, and it's very well received. Excellent. Thank you. Can you share with us a couple of uh, HPT type project efforts that you've been involved in over the years? Oh gosh, uh, sure. Some uh, of your favorites. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Not all of them. <laughs> Well, one of the uh, one of the ones uh, actually is uh, that is one that was reported, reported on here at this conference, and it was done by uh, Ellen Amai, uh, who at the time was a was a client of mine uh, at uh, A.C. Nielsen, and uh, the problem that she had was they have uh, very high level uh, consultants globally who uh, who work with uh, uh, major corporations on uh, marketing strategy and product strategy. And they, um, uh, uh, and, and the challenge that they faced was uh, 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 attempting to uh, standardize the performance and establish the expertise of these people. Uh, they all came up, they're all very long in the tooth uh, in the organization. They have you know, a great deal of organizational experience, but it's all different. And, mm -hmm. and, and what they tend to do depends a lot on what it is that they, uh, that uh, what what experience that they happen to have had, and so the question is, how do you capture that? How do you establish a baseline of performance competence for somebody operating at that very high level of expertise? And we we worked out using the uh, principles of cognitive learning theory, um, uh, and doing a bit of a cognitive task analysis. We worked out a uh, uh, an approach uh, to this to this kind of really ill structured problem solving. Now, this is not perceived. These people don't do procedures. Every problem they face is unique, and uh, they uh, and, and so this is ill-structured problem solving. So the question is, how do you attack the problem of uh, of assessing uh, uh, ill-structured problem solving, and uh, and ultimately also training people in ill-structured problem solving? And we worked out a, a very very interesting approach. And because Nielsen has a uh, has a uh, a very data-driven kind of a culture. It's full of statisticians. Uh, they, uh, she was able to get uh, uh, data on meaningful business impact in terms of uh, size of engagements, uh, return on investment for their clients because they report that uh, mm -hmm. to their clients uh, and so on, uh, which uh, which showed some some very substantial payoffs uh, for uh, for this kind of approach globally. And uh, she just very exciting work. Just just reported on it, uh, at the conference here. Very good. Thank you. Do you have a 30-second elevator speech on HPT or some explanation that you use when people ask you about HPT or what you do? Yeah, the, the, pr 
principal message that I try to get across is that HBT is a systematic way of thinking about the problem of human performance in organizations. And uh, with that come some analytical approaches uh, to figuring out what the problems are and how to measure the problem. It's a very measurement driven kind of a field. Uh, so we think we tend to th we tend to spend a lot of time thinking in terms of metrics. Uh, the uh, 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 yeah, at the same time, it invokes or draws on a wide range of interventions, and uh, 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 so it uh, it provides a framework for a multidisciplinary intervention uh, to improve to improve uh, performance human performance in organizations. Okay, thank you. Do you have a current focus or set of activities that you are pursuing in terms of your own learning and expanding else in, in, in HPT or elsewhere that you can share with us? Yeah, I, I've been I've been interested for some time in in the challenge of uh, expertise in organizations, high level expertise. Uh, you know, in any organization at any level, there are there are people who are the MVPs, the most valuable players. And uh, you know, they're typically they've been people who've been around for 10, 15, 20 years, and you can throw them any kind of an oddball problem and they'll figure it out, uh, uh, and so on. But uh, uh, if you ask, how did you learn that? Uh, or, or if you ask, how do we teach other people to do that? They'll tell you, they'll oftentimes, they'll tell you, can't be taught. Uh, the, only, the only thing you do is to live it the way I did. And so on. Well, the research on that uh, actually has sh uh, shown quite a lot about how you can teach that and how you can measure that kind of expertise. Uh, and, and it can be done with a great deal more efficiency than just trial and error over a period of, de of decades. Uh, uh, and um, uh, this requires a different kind of an analytical approach, a different kind of uh, um, uh, 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 or an approach to measurement than typically is the case with other kinds of training. Uh, and therefore, oftentimes, has, uh, even though this is the most valuable kind of a skill uh, in an organization, uh, uh, it is something which the training department typically doesn't even think of. They don't, mm -hmm. they don't, they don't, they aren't focused on it at all. Uh, therefore, and what the training department does tend to focus on tends to be the low-level procedural stuff and so on, which they can, which they can define. And, uh, and, uh, and that's a real problem because it means that the training department isn't working on the things that are most important to the organization. Uh, uh, and at the same time, organizations are at great risk because, uh, because their most valuable players are, uh, are, are small in number and they can't replicate them. And so, so uh, I've, been, I've, been, I've been working for a number of years on, on the issues surrounding understanding what expertise is, how to measure it, how to teach it. Uh, uh, how to define it uh, uh, in an organization, and, there, and, and, and thanks to some advances in cognitive psychology uh, over the last uh, oh, 10, 15 years or, uh, years or so, um, uh, we, uh, we know a lot more than we did mm -hmm. and about, about those things, and, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's still cutting edge work. There's still, there's still a, bunch of, a bunch of questions we don't know answers to, but but there are a lot of things we do, and and it's 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 uh, uh, I think I think it's I think it's a very very valuable contribution for any any uh, corporation. Mm -hmm. Can you suggest any uh, preliminary starting kind of articles or books that someone who is interested in this might pursue? Well, there's one in the uh, by Dave Johnson in the in the new handbook actually, which is a good place to start. And there are actually and there are actually two chapters. That's one. Another one. Is by Steve uh, Belichick and Deb Stone on cognitive task analysis, and and those two chapters together, uh, Dave Johnson focuses on on how you teach expertise or high level problem solving, uh, and uh, 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 Steve and, and uh, uh, focus uh, Steve's chapter focuses on how it is you analyze it, and those two chapters together are uh, I, I think are a very good place to start. Well, thank you. You've been recently getting more involved, I think you've been involved since day one of our professional designation here at ISPI, the uh, uh, Certified Profe uh, 
performance technologist, excuse me, it's early in yeah. the morning. Um, but uh, you've kind of taken over the helm of this operation from Judy Hale, mm -hmm. and can you give us an update of what's going on with the CPT world? Well, nobody takes over anything from Judy Hale, but the, uh, uh, I've, been, I've been honored to work very closely with Judy Hale for, for many, many years. And uh, what's, what's happening with the CPT uh, is that uh, um, uh, it's 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 growing uh, really explosively in a in a bunch of directions. Uh, first of all, the the basic professional certification of the CPT itself uh, is uh, is achieving uh, a great deal of recognition. We are seeing major employers uh, requiring CPTs uh, in uh, as, uh, as a contractual requirement or as a qualification requirement for hiring. We are seeing um, a great deal of interest in uh, uh, you know, in the benefits of the CPT, in, uh, just as individual practitioners. So that's that's one place to start. And we're now in what amounts to sort of we're beginning sort of the third round of codification of the body of knowledge uh, surrounding uh, surrounding HPT, uh, and. Uh, that, that I think is, is again is an influence. It's a, it's a direct influence of the uh, of the evolution of the CPT. So that's one kind of thing that's going on. But then co uh, corresponding to that, um, uh, we are we uh, we are receiving inquiries uh, and requests from corporations, governmental organizations, uh, large professional associations, saying we like what's going on with HPT. We want to uh, we want to certify our organization. Um, in HPT confidence, we want to certify because we like the principles you stand for. Uh, we want to certify uh, uh, individual courses uh, as uh, as being as being designed according to the according to the principles you stand for, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so on, and and uh, a bunch of efforts like that. There are also academic training programs that uh, we've, we've been asked to to uh, to examine and to, and to, and to uh, credential. Um, and so on. So there are. So there are. What, what's happening is that there is a whole universe now, evolving very rapidly, of uh, of uh, uh, efforts to credential um, uh, not just people but also products, services, programs uh, around the principles of HPT. And uh, uh, that is that's a very exciting development. Uh, creates all kinds of opportunities for ISPI and its members. And uh, uh, and it's, and it's a, just a tremendous time to be uh, to be involved in the society. Sounds very exciting. When when will the rest of the society hear more about uh, this? Because this is news to me. I, I, this is quite exciting. Yeah. Well, um, watch closely. It's if if you do something really, you know, like read the minutes of the CPT committee and stuff, <laughs> okay. stuff like that, then you would know know this stuff is going on. But but. Um, uh, 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 there will be, uh, you know, as you know, well as an example, we have uh, the society uh, recently signed a contract with a uh, uh, with a, uh, a a major airline to uh, uh, to provide uh, credentialing for their training operation uh, as an as an HPT operation. Uh, we have a long-standing relationship with the Coast Guard, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is really a strategic relationship on both sides, and uh, 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 and that has been a significant, important driver of the uh, uh, of the evolution of the HP of, uh, of uh, CPT, uh, and so on. You know, so 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 these things have been going on, and uh, and and they're growing. Excellent. One of the objectives of this particular video series is to talk about some of uh, the people. Our favorite people in the society, whether or uh, that are involved in HPT, whether they're members of the society or not, but but what if you could could you share with us some stories about maybe professional activities you were involved in and personal activities you've been involved in with some of your favorite members of uh, NSPI going back to the old days and currently ISPI? Oh gosh, uh, there are so many. <laughs> going back to the days uh, uh, of uh, the. Uh, the original development of the uh, of the uh, CPT standards uh, work, for example, and going back before that to the original development of, of IBSTIPI, of the International Board of Standards for Training, Performance, and Instruction, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, which I was a part of and 
so were a bunch of other people, Ken Silber, uh, Judy Hale, uh, and so on. We got together, uh, Maury Coleman uh, and, and, uh, and others, we got together uh, uh, over a, a, a string of interminable weekends at Arthur Anderson in the Chicago area. Uh, and uh, and worked on worked on on those standards and tried to figure out what it was that you could define meaningfully about this field and came up with the um, uh, uh, with the concept of, of a performance based uh, uh, definition and a and performance based association rather than a knowledge based one. For our audience, how far does that activity go back? Oh, good lord! Uh, let's see. We started working on that in the. In about 19, let me just think, it would have been about 1977 or 78. Okay. About probably about 1978. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and those standards still exist today, right? Those standards still exist. They're now in their third generation mm -hmm. and uh, their, third, their third major revision. I'm getting ready to do a fourth one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and that has expanded also and it's had considerable influence over, uh, uh, over uh, academic programs and other. Uh, other kinds of uh, sources, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So I've developed some very long working relationships with with these people, and uh, uh, of course my you know my co-author and partner in crime on lots of things has been Ken Silver. And uh, one of the things you have to understand about Ken is that uh, he's a night person. Uh, he will do his best work uh, uh, starting at about 11 p.m. And uh, I'm a morning person. And so the question always became, when do we get together to work? And uh, uh, we figured out over the years that there was absolutely no point in getting started before about uh, uh, no, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Because, uh, um, and even then, you know, Ken was going to be answering questions in, with one word answers, and that was going to be about the extent <laughs> of it. And so on. And meanwhile, you know, and I'm bouncing off the walls because it's the, you know middle of the day for me, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and you know, and so I'm you know I'm doing all kinds of stuff, and uh, and so on. And then along about oh three four o'clock in the afternoon or so, when I'm beginning to fade, and so on, Ken is just beginning to wake up, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and he's the one who's sort of bouncing off the wall, and I'm beginning to slide down into one word <laughs> sentences, and uh, and so on. And we keep going until about uh, you know by about eight o'clock at night. There was no point in continuing, and that's when Ken was his peak, <laughs> and he so he'd go off and write something, and by you know by two o'clock in the morning there'd be some major major chunk of work accomplished uh, and, and waiting for me in my inbox when I got up at, uh, at six o'clock in the morning the next morning. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it, it's always been a lot of fun to work to, uh, work with him. Any any personal aspects about Judy Hale that you can share with us? Oh gee. Um, There are always a great many. Uh, uh, Be careful now. <laughs> well, uh, 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 Judy's uh, 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 Judy has some has always had dogs mm -hmm. and uh, uh, still does, and um, uh, uh, they tend to be sort of not not little teeny rat dogs, but mm -hmm. sort of medium sized dogs. Uh, and so on, and they have the run of the house. Uh, they, uh, uh, Judy kind of lives there, but they own the place, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, 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 that becomes that becomes quite clear in in, in the relationship. And it, it's always fun to watch them interacting, uh, and, and so on. Judy Judy is a very caring person for everybody that she deals with, and uh, and she and she pays very close attention to what people need. And has a great deal of insight about that, and uh, and finds a way to make that happen in a in a in a win-win situation. Well, that's the way she treats the dogs too, mm -hmm. and uh, and so the dogs. Uh, oh, you know, uh, uh, so the, the the relationship between Judy and her dogs, in, in terms of ex each expressing what the other needs and each each helping the other, and so on, is always just a lot of fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Well, let me shift gears here um, to ask you what you what you might vision a future state for ISPI to be five or ten years out. How would you see us being the same, and how would you see us being different? If you were to architect the future state for us, yeah, I I uh, I think ISPI 
you know, ISPI has has uh, uh, always maintained a principle of uh, intellectual discipline and intellectual honesty, really, uh, uh, and professionalism, uh, which uh, which is the one of the core values that's that's brought me to the society and kept me in the society. Um, uh, 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 ISPI has never has never attempted to be. Uh, to be a trendy kind of a thing, it's, uh, it, it, it's always it's always been a principles-based organization, and uh, and and uh, I think that's that's central to uh, to the professional identity of the society, um, and uh, and again, I think it's one of the it's the big attraction, uh, uh, one of the big attractions I think for me uh, that's kept me kept me involved all these years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think there's a great deal of demand for that kind of uh, uh, that kind of uh, of, uh, of a society now, but not just the society itself. I think I think there there is there 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 is growth, or there will be growth uh, globally mm -hmm. uh, 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 in society membership. But you know, this you know, but but there will never be a million. ISPI members. Uh, you know, that's right. that. That's not. It's you know. It's not a, Not going to be that kind of organization. It's always going to be a um, a core professional kind of an organization. Having said that, the principles of HBT are very powerful and are uh, and are are I think becoming uh, rapidly uh, recognized uh, by the uh, by the larger HR community. As something that's really desirable, something that they need, mm -hmm. and again, this is globally. This is globally. How, how do we begin to serve uh, a global audience uh, better? Better because we have been, but you know, what we can have, we do to improve? We have been. Uh, I think. Well, for one thing, I think we're following. We're we're following our clients there, or our member, member organizations. The mm -hmm. uh, the companies, many of the companies that are that are supporters of, of ISPI. And advocates of ISPI are inherently global companies, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and so we're following them uh, into uh, 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 into global culture. There is uh, there are uh, as a result there are now uh, efforts uh, uh, to create professional communities uh, of practice uh, surrounding HPT uh, in Europe, in Asia, uh, in in a number of countries. And uh, I think those efforts are going to grow. Uh, in addition to that, of course, once again, the uh, military, especially Coast Guard and Navy, mm -hmm. uh, have been um, have been uh, uh, major adopters of HBT, and uh, uh, and uh, naturally they work with their allies all over the world too. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, the, um, that's that's another driver. A third driver is government and not for profit. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, again, there have been there are major advocates in, in both places, and uh, 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 globally, and, uh, and you know, working from the United States outward into their global contacts, will, they will carry the message of HPT with them. Well, thank you today for this interview, and uh, I hope that you'll allow me to revisit you this with you uh, uh, several years out. Absolutely, thank you.